the Christian Reformed Church itself is, I think, in some trouble. And now me saying that will probably get me into some of the trouble that you've brought down upon yourself. <laughs> but I've Welcome I've to the not couple. been I've not been shy about talking <laughs> about this. There are so few liberal religious communities that are as creative and careful about the aesthetics of their experience as conservative churches are. And I always think, why do the worst ideas, in my view, obviously, have the best branding? (laughs) That's not fair. Well, hello and welcome to this week's edition of the video. Uh, Do make sure to like today's video and subscribe to the channel for more content from Unbelievable. Uh, That's the thing I have to do at the beginning of every video, just to make sure that you on YouTube subscribe to this channel. Because as one of my guests, Paul Vanderclay knows, it's all about subscribers on YouTube (laughs) and and James Croft, who's my other guest on the show today. But seriously, uh, we would love you to keep up with the uh, the channel, with the debates and discussions we host here. Um, and it is my great delight on the show today to be welcoming two long time sort of listeners and people who have, you know, been involved with Unbelievable over the years, um, James Croft and Paul Vanderclay. Um, we're asking today, is there a future for godless congregations? James is the leader of the Ethical Society of St. Louis, the USA's largest congregation of ethical culture that's a non-religious humanist movement with its roots in the late 19th century however in a recent blog post he declared that ethical culture as a network was dead and that so-called godless congregations need to rethink their approach to community activism and working collectively if they're to survive and thrive in the future um well that sounds a bit familiar doesn't it and today we're going to be asking how much do these humanist communities have in common with many mainline church denominations that are also in decline in the West. And what exactly happens in a godless Sunday service anyway? Um, engaging with James today is Paul van der Klee, um, someone I've been meaning to have on the show for, for forever, really. And today seemed like a good opportunity. So, Paul, welcome along. Um, Paul is a minister in the Christian Reformed Church in North America, pastors a congregation in Sacramento, but keeps his finger on the theological pulse of secular and Christian culture through his very uh, increasingly popular video channel. So um, really looking forward to this conversation today, James and Paul. Um, the first thing I'm aware of, James, is did I even pronounce the, the place correctly? Is it St. Louis or St. Louis? I never quite know. All British people seem to say St. Louis. I had to learn that St. Louisans <laughs> say St. Louis when I moved to the city okay. about eight years ago. Oh, there you go. Well, I stand corrected. Uh, the, the Ethical Society of St. Louis in that case. Uh, but you're a Brit, of course, James. So tell us about how, how you ended up uh, at uh, St. Louis and and yeah, just a little bit of a background of the congregation itself as well. I'm going to try and keep this pretty short because it could be a very long story. But I, I grew up in southwest London and I grew up in a non-religious family. Neither of my parents were religious. They weren't kind of strong new atheist types, but they didn't go to church. They never professed religion in their life. And so it was never really a part of my life. And I never would have imagined when I was a kid that I would be leading a congregation as my profession. It just wasn't an option. It wasn't something I considered. But I got very involved in the humanist community at Harvard when I was a grad student. I graduated from Cambridge. I was a high school teacher for a little bit in London. I was a terrible teacher. I mean, truly disastrous teacher. So I retreated back to grad school and moved across the pond to the United States to study education. And there I found like that my religious views, not being religious, was just a lot less common in the United States than it is in England. And I felt the need to be around people who were a little bit more like me in terms of my religious values. And that drew me to the humanist communities on campus, which are pretty vibrant. There are a lot of non-religious people on Harvard's campus, and they've got some really great support, particularly from Greg Epstein, who I know you've had on the show, who wrote that book, Good Without God. He's their heart, uh, the humanist chaplain there. And I got to know Greg shortly after I got on campus. And that community became a big part of my life. They were people who you know, I went to when I was struggling with things. But I think a similar experience that many people would have with their religious community, this humanist community provided for me. I even ended up coming out of the closet to them um, on a service trip to New Orleans after Katrina. And so they really provided me with an extraordinary amount of support at a time in my life when I really needed it. And what I slowly realized was that the things that I was doing with that community were becoming more vital 
for me than my academic work. And they were where more of my attention was focused. And it happened to be the case that at that time, we were trying to create a real congregational community for humanists on campus. It didn't exist yet, but we had an idea that there could be something like an analog of a church or a temple for people who were not traditionally religious, but wanted a community based around shared values. And so I was part of building that community and it became a real place. You know, for a while we had a real space where people would come on Sunday and we had talks mm -hmm. and music. And I just loved the community that we were able to build. And so when I first encountered ethical culture, which is the very old fashioned name for the movement I'm a part of, um, it, which is a network of humanist congregations, I realized I could make a career out of what had become my passion. And I experienced a calling, honestly. I visited the New York Society for Ethical Culture, mm. and I remember walking out onto the stage, gorgeous Art Nouveau, like dark wood walls and this beautiful plush velvet seats. And I had the most profound sense that it was my mission in life to fill it with people. And I had never encountered something like that before, the sense that I... I had a mission in life and I knew exactly what it was. Mm. And that day I inquired about training to become clergy in the movement. Leader is our very pompous term for our clergy. And that took me to St. Louis where I completed my training and very foolishly they hired me to be first their sort of equivalent of an associate <laughs> pastor. And then um, I took over as their lead pastor yeah. in the middle of COVID. It was a fantastic time to take over. <laughs> the leadership wow. of the congregation wow yeah what a time to to, to be put right. in that role gosh well, well we'll we'll hear about you know what what that's all come to in terms of you know being a bit of a firebrand in what is obviously a very old and arguably like many you know mainline denominations aging you know sort of movement and and so so th this is partly why i was interested to to have this conversation because on reading that article i just thought there are so many parallels here with with so many churches and church leaders that i hear from anyway and and that that was partly how I thought of you, Paul. Not because you have a sort of aging and declining congregation, as far as I know, but but you're very familiar with the issues that that exist uh, in this respect. Um, uh, tell us a little for those who who aren't familiar with what you do um, about the church you pastor, about your own ministry there, about what you do as well with the the okay. YouTube videos well, and everything else. I'm the pastor of a little Christian Reformed church in Sacramento, California, that is very much declining, aging. Many Protestant small Protestant churches really have about a 60 year lifespan. I'm a third generation Christian reform minister. My grandfather mostly pastored struggling little churches in the prairie. My father spent 36 years just outside of New York City in a mostly African American congregation and community. That's where I grew up. I did a, I worked for seven years overseas in the Dominican Republic and then came here to Sacramento, California to sort of a multi ethnic multi-everything congregation in this little struggling corner of Sacramento. I know a lot about church decline because I've, I've lived through a lot of it. And yeah, listening to some of your stories, there are certainly a lot of things that do sort of map onto the church. So about four years ago, I, I've always been sort of a lifelong learner and I blogged for a number of years, but then I watched the, um, the rise of Jordan Peterson, not so much in the culture war issues, but I began to notice that a lot of people listening to Jordan Peterson were leaving comments on YouTube and on Reddit saying things like, I used to be a fan of Sam Harris, and I watched Jordan Peterson's lectures about the Bible, and I kind of want to go back to church. And I thought, wow, I've seen a lot of one-way traffic towards atheism, and I see a considerable amount of traffic now coming the other way. And so I thought I didn't wasn't getting a lot of traction among my colleagues to talk about Jordan Peterson because it just didn't see, it seem to make much sense. So I decided to make a YouTube video, which was totally new to me. And before I knew it, I had a few hundred, then a few thousand subscribers and all sorts of people who wanted to have really significant spiritual conversations with me. And as the pastor of a small church, I think you can probably identify this with this. You can you can probably go quite a while without having substantive conversations with total strangers <laughs> who wish to explore questions of faith, atheism, rationality, all these kinds of things. And before I knew it, 
I have I could pray I could do this pretty much eight hours a day every day of the week right now thanks to YouTube. So I've been continuing to do commentary videos on Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, uh, John, Jonathan Peugeot, John Verveke, a bunch of, a bunch of other individuals like that. And, and yeah, it's just continued to, it's just continued to grow. And, but at the same time, mm. even though I have a thousand or fifteen hundred people who will lift, listen to the rough draft of my sermon on Sunday, especially in these COVID times. There might be ten or fifteen or twenty people in the room behind me. So I appreciate the kind yeah. of world you're living yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's such an interesting one, and I don't know who who knows. You know, until we we're, we're sort of so, a bit further through, you know, the end tail end of this pandemic, if if we can call it that, then. We'll, we'll maybe see what that does to you know in-person congregations generally but um i just thought it was fascinating to maybe bring you both together to talk about generally the the religiosity um the way that humans have you know always congregated whether around religious or in james's case non-religious kind of ideas um and and in a way james you know the, the ethical culture which is the network of churches that you you have the largest one of and you know and you know you, you spell out you know pretty frankly in the article you wrote the fact that you feel you know there isn't necessarily a future for for it now i don't know whether that's changed i know you did a, a follow-up article where you sort of said okay let's let's see if we can uh you know revisit this because i think you had a lot of a lot of you know interest and reaction to i to got in trouble article. justin but first of all yeah, I was going to say, uh, I, I saw some not so pleased congregant members commenting on your Facebook feed and all sorts after you posted it. But but either way, I, I don't want to get into the weeds of that. But but tell us like what what the background is to to ethical culture, what the vision was in a way of, of these non-religious congregations being planted and why why that just hasn't what your theory is for, for why it hasn't, you know, continue to thrive in you know in recent decades it really is a fascinating history because the theory behind it i think is still extremely wise and valuable for the day in which we live and a lot of the challenges that our founder saw in his age still persist today and suggest that there is a role for communities like this but it was founded our movement was founded by a guy called felix adler he was the son of a prominent new york rabbi and he was expected to take over his father's temple. And so they sent him when he was young to Germany to study religion. And like many young people, he sort of took a sidestep away from his parents' wishes. And he studied philosophy as well. He, en he ended up studying more philosophy than religion, studied a bunch of Neo-Kantian philosophy. And in the process, he came to the conclusion that he couldn't intellectually justify belief in a personal God. And that's a bit of a problem when you're supposed to become a, a Jewish rabbi. And so he returned to the United States and he was invited to give a sermon at his father's temple. And he gave a talk called the Judaism of the future. And he sort of reimagined Judaism as a universal religion. So no idea of a chosen people with a particular revelation or relationship to the divine based purely on ethics and right relationship between people. So he wanted to uplift what he saw as the moral character of the Jewish people throughout history as the thing worth worshipping, because that was really what he thought was the centre of the religion. And thirdly, no reference to a personal God. And his father's congregation was not having that. They did not like that. He was never, in <laughs> fact, invited to speak at his father's temple again. But enough of the members of the community were excited by the vision that he put forward that they got together to support him in developing something new. And that became the first ethical society, the New York Society for Ethical Culture. It was the Gilded Age. I'm not sure if anyone's watching the new Julian Fellows TV show about that period in history, but you've got a lot of very wealthy philanthropists willing to give their money to social causes. And he ran in those circles. And so he was able to pull on very wealthy, politically and culturally influential backers. He was very charismatic everywhere he went around the United States and internationally, including across the UK. Ethical societies sprang up. There were a number of them across England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. And 
So he was really a founder of a new religious movement. He saw it as a religious movement. He didn't call it non-religious at, at that time. So the late 1800s... Would, would, would he have been behind the, the, the one in London, the, the, the Conway yes, Hall Ethical that, Society? The Conway Hall Ethical right. Society was one of our congregations. It's now no longer really mm -hmm. a congregation, but you see the sort of influence that our movement has had in the institutions it built. The What is now Humanist UK grew out of the Federation of Ethical Societies in the United Kingdom. And the same is true of right. the of Humanists International, the International Federation of Humanist Organizations. So he had an enormous impact on contemporary humanism because he was an institution builder and a community builder. He realized that religious ideas don't live in the abstract. They live in community and in institutions. And so he built the institutions to continue them when he wasn't going to be around himself. And so that St. Louis, the society that I serve, is what was one of the first to be founded. It's about 135 years old. It's, as you said, the biggest society. We have a pledging membership of 300 to 400 members. I, I, I forget how many adult members we have right now because COVID is very unusual. So I'm trying not to think about it much. Um, and <laughs> so that's a, a healthy mid-sized congregation, bigger than a lot of the traditionally religious congregations in our city. And my community is very healthy. But many of the 24 or so ethical societies that exist are very sick. They have very small memberships. They are, um, the membership is very elderly. That in itself isn't a problem. You can have a very healthy community of older people, mm. but these communities are not healthy. They don't have a clear vision of the future. Often they feel very worried about whether their community will outlive them, honestly. Um, we've had real struggle planting any new congregations. We haven't successfully planted that many really over the last 10 years that I've been involved and beyond. And there's a, a sense of drift, you know, a sense that we don't understand what our role is in 21st century society. And one of the things I really appreciate about our founder is he knew exactly what he was doing and why he was doing it. You can read the founding address that he gave when he built the first ethical society. And it's just mm. a very clear enunciation of important moral principles and the social role of congregations. And we seem to have lost that energy. And I wrote my article because I think that's very sad and that we need to do something about it. And I didn't see us doing anything about it. It made some people very unhappy. <laughs> you saw some of those comments. Um, particularly people who thought I was talking about my own community, which I wasn't. I, I, my community is very mm -hmm. healthy and mm -hmm. I love it. And I think it's a, a model sure, for other sure. communities like us. Yeah. But it's so different to so many of the ethical societies I visit. Mm -hmm. The feeling mm -hmm. is so different. You can, mm -hmm. I'm sure, Paul, mm -hmm. you understand, when you visit a healthy congregation, it feels a certain way. The connection between people, the love they have for each other, it feels like life, like you're walking into a life-filled space. And when you visit one that doesn't have that, it's like a void. It's like this sad, disconnected thing. And I just want the other ones to feel like ours and I can't make it happen. So this was my attempt yeah. to say, yeah. to yell into yeah. the void and say, please come back to life. I. Well, in a way, you know, how many church leaders have wanted to bottle, you know, the vibe, the spirit, if you will, in, in one place and try and transfer it to another. But it doesn't always work like that. I don't know, Paul, if you've got any commentary on this, because I mean, what's going on? I, I mean, I don't know what the, the, the overall state of your particular denomination is, but we know that many mainline denominations in the West, in the US, certainly in the UK, have, have been in decline for a long time. That's not to say there aren't exceptions to that within individual congregations. And obviously there are other church networks and denominations that, that are, you know, growing and especially obviously in other parts of the world. But but having said all that, you know, I, I do get the sense that, that a lot of what James described there, you could easily map onto, you know, certain congregations and church denominations in the West. So 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 is it the same thing? Uh, what's the difference? Um, what what for you are the contributing factors to to that that sort of trend and decline? The Christian Reform Church itself is, I think, in some trouble. And now me saying that will probably get me into some of the trouble that you brought down upon yourself. <laughs> But I've Welcome I've to the not couple. been I've not been shy about talking <laughs> about this. Uh, the Christian Reformed Church, I think, when my father in the 1980s was working with our home missions department, they set a goal for uh, 400,000 by 2,000, 
And right now, if the Christian Reformed Church has 200,000 by 2025, I think we'll be doing okay. So, and, and that is merit. I mean, the Pew studies have all shown that there's been a pretty precipitous decline even before COVID in church attendance in the United States. And the United States is, at least of the Western developed nations, exceptional in its levels of church participation. I, I think this is, a, this is a topic of endless study for pastors and denominations presently. I'm fascinated by the story of of your group, especially with its roots in Judaism, it, it all makes a lot of sense to me, given the the cultural trajectory of the end of the 19th century and a lot of other movements that developed. And it also strikes me as interesting in terms of questions of, let's say, mythology, because as I look at now the I just I just got off a conversation with someone who is typical of the Jordan Peterson journey and that this person was a devotee of Sam Harris and and many American atheists work to excel in morality. But I think for many of them, part of the reason that they start getting interested again in the Bible, and sometimes even in, in very old forms of Christianity, such as Orthodoxy or Catholicism, is the embrace of a mythos. And, and I think at the 19th century, there was sort of, a, sort of an implicit mythos that developed that we don't need these stories. We can sort of embody morality purely. I mean, you see... Um, you know, you see instantiations like Lady Liberty or Lady Justice, and, and they're quasi-godlike, but obviously in a secular context, sort of without a god. And so I think what we're going to see probably in the next 50 years is a lot of going back to mythos and trying to figure out how do our stories of um, narrative beings affect the cohesion of a community that can form around such a story. And of course, the, the Jews and the Hebrews were the foundations mm. of this sort of thing. I mean, that, that makes me want to ask you, James, what, what is it that your congregation gathers around in that sense? Because obviously in, in a Christian context, arguably, you know, <laughs> whether a church is doing well or declining or whatever, there is at least a sort of central thing, Jesus Christ, that, that is the, the, the gathering point, the touchstone. What, what would you say is that thing that, that, you know, that equivalent thing, I suppose, in, in your case? Well, I think the way Paul put it is very insightful. I mean, I think that if you were to ask Adler, our founder, he did have a, a mythic account of pure ethics, right? He actually, he didn't entirely do away with the language of divinity himself. He got, a, got, got rid of the personal God, but he came up with this very weird philosophically complicated idea of what he called the social divinity, which is kind of the idealized community. And so he had a mythic story to tell. And when you read his writing, he he writes like a religious prophet. It, it feels totally different from secular humanistic writing. It has a different aesthetic quality to it. And over the years, our movement became quite disconnected from that way of talking and thinking about even our own values. We very quickly became sort of allied to American pragmatist philosophy that has a very different, very fallibilistic, very skeptical, very kind of hesitant mode to it, which I, I mean, I'm a pragmatist. That's my philosophical training. Intellectually, I'm all about it. I think it's right. You know, I think it's a very good way to get at truth. It doesn't really stir the heart. You know, I don't feel like anyone's read a book by John Dewey and been like, Eureka, this is the moment my life has changed. <laughs> and that's kind of what you need to sustain religious energy. And so I think that there has been that problem. I mean, we, I, I do want to to caution us from thinking that this stuff is 
is all important because a lot of the studies show that actually the sort of theological beliefs and even mythic narratives of religious communities are not that important to members when they decide whether to join it. You know, when people research why people join religious communities, they often find that people are remarkably flexible about their actual religious beliefs. They're quite happy to hop the fence to a different denomination, even a different religion, if they find a community they want to be a part of. And so part of me wants to say, well, the community is the thing we're centered around, right? The actual relationships between the people is the central thing. But that doesn't quite satisfy me because there are lots of different ways of organizing a community and I have to lead them somewhere. And I do have an idea of where I'm leading people. And so it is a sense of the, the idea of human dignity as a fundamental value mm. of creating a world mm. in which that dignity is respected. That's what we keep going back to. That's what we circle around. In what ways in yeah. our current society is the dignity of people being traduced? How can we find ways to fix that? Whether I express that in sufficiently engaging narrative form, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm okay. trying. Well, what I'd be interested in uh, on the other side of a short break is is to get a sense of of you know what that looks like on a sunday morning you know because as far as i'm aware james that that's the typical time you you do gather so it it probably to some extent i imagine looks and feels a bit like in some in some regards you know a church service but but obviously done done in the way that you do it so we'll come back to that i'm i'm, I'm really fascinated to hear kind of what a sunday morning looks like at the Ethical Society of St Louis um and we'll continue hearing from from paul vanderclay as well we're talking about is there a future for godless congregations? Frankly, is there a future for some god believing <laughs> congregations as well? Because that's that's you know those are the trends and that we're talking about on the show today. Um, uh, and we're not here to depress you. I hope that in some way what we what we end up with is is something that is helpful wherever you sit, whichever side of the fence you sit on uh, on today's show. But we'll be back in just a moment's time. If you enjoy watching The Unbelievable Show, why don't you come along and experience it live? There are two amazing opportunities coming up. Firstly, our Unbelievable Live event with Philip Yancey. The veteran writer and Christian thinker will be joining me to talk about his life and ministry and to answer your questions on Jesus, faith and the church. In fact, we're calling it Ask Philip Yancey Anything. So ask away on our live webinar on Tuesday the 1st of March. It's free, but you need to register at unbelievable.live. Not only that, we've just launched ticketing for our annual Premier Unbelievable Conference. It's happening on Saturday the 14th of May, live from the historic venue of the British Library in London. You can join in person or online from anywhere in the world. God Unmuted is our theme. In a confused and divided age, learn how the church can find its authentic voice again. Our seminars, discussions and Q&A will include Alistair McGrath, Lisa Fields, Glenn Scrivener, John Wyatt, Bishop Joseph D'Souza, Sky Jatani and Phil Vischer, helping you to speak with truth and grace in uncertain times. It's hosted by myself and Ruth Jackson with more guests to be announced. Again, you can be part of Unbelievable 2022, God Unmuted and our Ask Philip Yancey Anything event from anywhere in the world. Just visit unbelievable.live Welcome back to today's show. We're talking about godless congregations. In fact, James Croft leads one of the largest uh, godless congregations, if you will, the Ethical Society of St. Louis, uh, which is part of Ethical Culture, uh, a network of these congregations that's very historic, but has been dwindling over the years. And he wrote quite an interesting article, got a lot of feedback on it, uh, saying perhaps the movement's dead. Um, perhaps we need to rethink the way that we do these kinds of gatherings and community. Um, engaging with James on that today is Paul van der Klee, who himself is a pastor of a small church in Sacramento, uh, but runs a very thriving YouTube channel um, looking at theological and cultural issues. Um, and just in that last section, uh, James was talking about the fact that in his view, community is really what it's about and in fact people are quite willing to you know jump ship to different theological traditions or even religions you know if, if there's a community to be had there 
Um, one of one of the things as well that, that 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 James said in his article was people benefit enormously from being a member of a congregation, since all religion is developed to meet human needs. The idea of a religion that is divorced from false and harmful beliefs is a good one, a way of returning to the human roots of all religious faith. So, as far as James is concerned, you know, it's it's benefits all round if if you can develop something that's truly ethical in his view and doesn't need the god factor but what's what's your view on that that idea that really it's community is what's attracting people to, to churches and so on paul and the god thing you know could be arguably dispensed of it, it obviously works in james's case so so what's what's your view on i that? don't know that people are attracted to churches for ethical high-minded reasons i find that most of my members come to church in order to sustain often an ethical life, usually much more in the private sphere. You know, perhaps they have a difficult marriage. Perhaps they're struggling with a temptation or a sin or something even more broadly that's bringing them down, and they need encouragement to get through the day. And in order to muster that kind of resolve, you know, at least obviously in Christian terms, they need an encounter with their God. They need to hear from their God. They need to bring their gifts. They need to be encouraged by their people. Part, part of what I jumped into the internet fray for was that, in fact, I saw a lot of people were getting interested in listening to Jordan Peterson videos, enjoying online debate, and I saw they didn't have communities. And so actually part of what I've been working on is in some ways establishing communities analogous to what you've been doing because I've started what I call estuary groups that are intentionally alongside the church where people can be heretics or or other things. They don't necessarily need to propositionally embrace a confession or a creed, but yet they need a space to talk about and to process what they've been doing. I, I think a big part of this is also the fact that in the United States, for example, even during COVID, we've seen a resurgence of all sorts of issue-based enthusiasm. If people are against racism, they might embrace Black Lives Matter. If they're for or against abortion, they'll embrace a cause. And I think part of the difficulty that a community that tries to organize around ethics per se is that whereas if there's a cause, they'll join, but in terms of sort of a sustaining thing, Ethics, as we said before, kind of is like, well, of course, ethics, goodness, rightness, sure, but what? And so, again, I, I think probably the, the gripping thing for people, in my experience as a pastor, is Jesus becoming a focal point in which many of these issues can cohere. And what tends to happen is along the spectrum of, let's say, mainline to evangelical or fundamentalist, the different issues cohere in different ways, but Jesus remains the focal point. Then you have this strangeness that for one person, you know, Jesus, their love of Jesus might mean people should have the choice of ending an unwanted pregnancy, whereas for others, it's Jesus that makes them rise to the challenge of more restrictive abortion laws. So I think there are a lot of issues going on in in this um, with this question. Hmm. Um, James, you may want to respond to that, but I also want to sort of yeah get get a sense of what does happen. You know, when you do actually meet uh, on a Sunday morning, what. Um, I, I, about 10 years ago, I did a show that you'll, you'll with someone you, you'll know well, Sanderson Jones, who founded the Sunday Assembly. And there was a lot of sort of newspaper articles at that time of this sort of, you know, church without God meeting on Sundays. Um, they sing pop songs instead of hymns. They have a comedian give the talk instead of a sermon and, and all of that. And, and everyone found it quite novel. But actually you know it's been going on for over 100 years perhaps not in that specific style but at <laughs> least you know you're you're this it wasn't like sanderson jones invented this there, there's been forms of you know cumanist congregations you know meeting on sundays for a long time so uh, you're not the sunday assembly um but what are you what what does does a sunday look like at, at your congregation we're, we're definitely nowhere near as high energy and uh, as funny as sunday assembly is <laughs> i try but i've never been a comedian like sanderson so um yeah sanderson's great and i i love the sunday assembly as an idea and as a movement i for, before i get into that i think that paul said yeah. something really 
valuable, lots of things really valuable, particularly at the end of his last reply where you were talking, Paul, about how, yes, religious communities do seem to have, or traditionally religious communities seem to have a, a centre around which people are anchored. And yet that doesn't, the, the values around which they're anchored or the story around which they're anchored doesn't necessarily neatly translate into specific ethical behaviours or actions. And indeed, people can have totally opposite views of what's right and wrong based on the same set of mythic narratives. And I think that that might reveal that it's not as simple as, you know, Christian churches get to unify around something really clear and powerful and non-religious congregations don't, right? It's actually complicated. And we have a range of views within our community about right and wrong particular issues. And we also have a lot of commonality around the concerns and the way that we approach ethics. And it's not like there's nothing there. There are literally thousands of years of non-theistic philosophies to draw on, which have been grappling with the, many of the same existential, spiritual and ethical questions that religions have always grappled with. So it, it's, it's not a, an empty space. Um, that said, uh, it, it has always intrigued me, and this gets to your question, Justin, that the actual gatherings of ethical societies will tend to look very similar to those of many liberal Protestant Christian congregations, for instance. We've got music, we've got a main talk from a podium, we've got more music, we have a, a opening words from a member about why they're a member of the community. It will look like, honestly, a relatively conservative mainline church service. And one of the things that has always frustrated and confused me is the fact that, at least in my view, the most innovative communities regarding how they gather are often the most conservative in terms of the views that they espouse. Like, I occasionally, I like to go to religious communities to see what they do. I'm like a magpie. I love to go and steal their ideas. <laughs> I'll steal, like, literature, flyers, like, anything they can give me, I'll take, and I'll be like, I want one of these for us. My staff think I'm absolutely insane for all the things I take from these churches. <laughs> but I go to these mega churches in my area, and we have big mega churches in Missouri. And it's fantastic. I love it. The music is amazing. The lighting is sumptuous. The storytelling, they give these wonderful sermons and the music swells behind them and it matches the emotion of what they're saying. And I'm like, why? Why can't I have this? I don't, no one's telling me not to, right? I don't have any theological, scriptural, liturgical reason not to be doing this. And yet I look like the Unitarians down the road already. I, look, I could be doing this in the 1800s. My stuff hasn't changed for hundreds of years. And so I just, that yeah. disjunction is really weird. There are so few liberal religious communities that are as creative and careful about the aesthetics of their experience as conservative churches are. And I always think, why do the worst ideas, in my view, obviously, have the best branding? <laughs> That's not fair. It, it's, it's funny, though. I wonder, James, here, here's my theory on this. OK, and it, it's generally true. I, I know this is a, a generalization, but, you know, if you just look at the statistics in general, evangelical, more conservative churches tend to um, be attracting more members. I mean, there is still decline, even in, you know, quite conservative, you know, um, denominations in the US, I know. But having said that, if you look at where there is growth and where there is sort of large numbers, as you say, tends to be in, in more conservative ones. And those are the ones that tend to put on the biggest show, have the most probably engaging forms of outreach and, and everything else. Now, arguably, is not is that just down to the fact that because they're conservative, they think this is a life or death matter, whether you join our church, we will do everything within our power. Whereas someone who is a Unitarian or a humanist, it, it doesn't actually, no one's eternal soul is a stake if they don't come to your church. And so it's going to make a difference as to how much, for want of a better word, effort you put in to to kind of drawing people in. I, what do you make of that theory, James? It's just it's just one that, that I think kind of makes sense. You're going to make me cry, Justin. I mean, I really wish that I didn't agree with you, but in a certain sense, I do. There's 
Uh, this is certainly not true in my own community. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we present the messages we present, who we invite, because something unusual about ethical studies is I don't speak every week. We have many different voices on purpose and many different types of music on purpose, right? We're trying to represent a diversity of ideas and of the creativity of humanity, which makes our job hard because we don't have the in-house band. We I don't get to control the experience every time. Um, but we do a great job and I love the programs we put on. But that's not universally true of every ethical society or humanist Unitarian congregation mm -hmm. I visited. And sometimes I am shocked about how little care I think is put into the mm -hmm. experience that's being provided. Now I've been to ones where I felt insulted because for me, it's funny. I understand why people who are traditionally religious think, oh, it's a life or death matter if you accept Jesus and are saved in this service. But for me, I just think, well, this is the one life we have. This is the only time we're going to experience this very moment together. Literally what is at stake is the entire rest of your existence. How you choose to live will determine all the time that you have on this earth and then it will be done and you will get nothing else. And that really matters. So the experience we put in mm. front of people really matters. So I've been trying for a long time to to get my movement to take that more seriously. And I don't I don't want to to suggest that my colleagues don't take it seriously because they do. They care. They've dedicated so much of their lives. You don't make a lot of money being an ethical culture leader and you don't get a lot of support <laughs> from a denominational body. You know, it's not like we're not flying around private jets and stuff. So these people really care, but somehow I don't always see that care translated into the craft which yeah. we use to, to share our message. And I don't understand that. So I kind of agree. Mm. I think I just don't know what to yeah. say. But what, what would you say to this? Because I'm, I'm also conscious at the same time that, you know, we've just had big podcasts like The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill warning us of the dangers of the mega church thing and the fact that style over substance can very often be the problem um and and so you know there's, there's no it's not as though one particular version of the church is winning uh often th there can be some quite toxic things going on underneath anyway in, the, in those situations but, but what yeah just interested in your in your response to to all of these sorts of part, things part of what you struggle with is you are grossly outgunned i mean in terms of church growth america i <laughs> when i in the 90s i I did a lot of reading in church growth movement and Lyle Shaler, who was one of the early founders, basically said countercultural, meaning conservative, usually countercultural churches grow because, you know, if you don't have the prevailing winds of a political party or a culture behind you, you need a community in which to maintain your ideals and to have them reinforced and encouraged. And so countercultural churches always have more enthusiasm and energy. Part of what I think all religious groups are dealing with in a place like North America is we're increasingly competing in real time. Physical groups are competing against the Internet. Like I said, I've got I've got a church of 60, 80 people and I've got an online following of thousands. And there, you know, a lot of people online think, well, when is Vander Clay going to give up his local church? And I keep telling them, no, actually, the local <laughs> church is where it's at. And the online thing is sort of a hobby. It's It seems strange. The, the other point to, to come back around too, I think even though it's very true that that in religious communities, people will have a lot of fighting about how, how Jesus feels about LGBTQ inclusion or how Jesus feels about abortion. The idea that there is a Jesus and he has an opinion tends to generate or tends to energize the conversation and the debate and even the conflict in a way that I think, again, is difficult if you don't actually have um, a person who is deciding that everyone spends a great deal of time singing and praying their love to. So I think I think that's another another part of there are many many layers to what we're what we're dealing with here both religious and non-religious mm. I, I mean there's also been you know sociological factors at play and james you might want to speak to this um because you know, it's not as though churches are the only sort of organizational sort of bodies that have seen decline in membership you know political parties you know um all kinds of you know social clubs and things 
generally it seems like people are less willing to get up get out and be part of a a community a, a sort of formalized community in that way so so i don't know is this just sort of across the board and if it is what's what what's your theory for why generally we're seeing that kind of change james in in our culture well you're right that there has been a massive decline in all sorts of forms of civic participation over the last few decades i mean that's well documented in the uk in the us and pretty much every wealthy nation you see the similar thing of less people going to church less people voting less people being a member of a political party or a union or a fraternal organization if those even exist anymore you know you, you do see that decline and of course that means it's difficult in a broader culture where people are finding other ways to spend their time and connecting with others in a real space it's very difficult to maintain membership of a congregation for instance and i accept that and i recognize it's a difficult environment to work in and sometimes when i have made criticisms of my own movement people say that they say Every, everyone's shrinking and so are we the, the problem I have with that argument is firstly, also millions and millions of people, particularly young people, are leaving their religion, right? So the pool of people who we could possibly draw from who might be aligned with our values is rapidly growing. And we're not seeing any of that growth. And I just don't believe there are more than a hundred Christian churches in St. Louis. There's one ethical society, right? I don't believe, or in London, right? There are millions and millions of people who live in London. I don't believe that there aren't a few thousand, at least, who would like a community that w like the one we create. And maybe that number shrunk from, there were tens of thousands 50 years ago, and now there's 5,000 today, right? But even if that's true, we're only getting a tenth of those people. So we, we have to be able to do better than we are, even in the climate that we're working in. I mean, that's my belief, but it, it is difficult. Maybe we need to change many ways about how we gather. And I, I'm open to ideas. No one seems to have come up with the, the, the <laughs> idea that's working. Um, maybe I should start a YouTube channel and that'll be it. Um, but, I, I still think that there's a space for these sorts of communities, particularly after COVID. I think people are hungry to be with each other. I don't think it's just me, but I have felt very sad about the fact that I, I never get to see anyone. And I go out in public now and I feel like I don't know how to do it anymore. I, like, I, how, do you, how do you speak to other humans? I don't know. And I think that there is a yearning within the human soul to be together in the real space where you can see each other's faces and touch each other. And that that doesn't just go away because of some demographic changes. I think that's part of the sort of animal that we are. And so I think we should be able to harness it. Hmm. Yeah. Paul? I, I really like what you said there. I wonder if part of what we're seeing, and you can see this in in divorce rates, you can see this in lower rates of marriage, is that in our increasingly cyber relational world, we are losing our capacity to maintain the kind of stable, formative, rigorous in-person relationships that previous generations were better equipped to do by virtue of the fact that they had to. Because one of the things that you recognize in terms of pastoring a local congregation is there's a fair amount of just teaching people how to get along. And I'm sure that's no different in your no difference in your group. And so I I do wonder yeah. On one hand, I see people saying, boy, I really need more community in my life. Boy, I'd, boy, I'd really love to have a spouse. Boy, I'd really like to have a, a fruitful, flourishing marriage. Yeah. Are you prepared for the kind of commitment, self-sacrifice, and work that all of that involves, especially with respect to an extended community like a congregation? Um, are you going to put your money where your mouth is? Are you going to volunteer your time? Are you going to give up Saturdays for cleaning the facility or doing a little bit of repair? Um, all of this on top of all of the other commitments and pleasurable activities that people are pursuing. It's usually with the rise of affluence. So I think there are a lot of tiny little issues that are probably 
beginning to sum up in the diminishment of people's capacity to maintain voluntary organizations together. And and that's the, the interesting thing for me, James, is, you know, you you say, you know, look, look at the big megachurch, but you sometimes wonder how much community is actually going on because the problem often is that there's a fantastic show on a Sunday, but not necessarily a huge amount of community going on alongside it. It's, it's kind of people showing up for another en- entertainment spectacle, frankly, you know, that's, that's always the danger. I know that that's again, a, a huge generalization, but, but genuine community, you know, isn't even necessarily, you know, happening in, in some of these, you know, quote unquote successful situations. So, yeah, it's. I think in a, in a way we're all to some extent we're all in the same boat, and we're asking, are we? You know, what's the clue? What what's the key? What how do you re-engage people who say they want to community? You know, feel that urge, but kind of I don't know. I do. Their bed is very warm on a Sunday morning, and they don't seem to make it into church. They can now watch online. You know, hey, I they feel that myself. Be there in person, like very often, I'm like, do I really want to do this? <laughs> I yeah I I mean okay so what's the difference then I suppose I mean coming back to you Paul part of me is thinking look James you know on an atheist worldview let's say uh I I have a huge amount of respect for for James just grinding and saying I really want this to happen and I don't believe there's a god out there who's kind of paving the way for me here it's you know it's 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 about making it happen you know by the sweat of my own brow we're going to get people to come along to this Uh, you paul do believe that there's a god and a spirit that is somehow working in the background and and so it can't just be how do we get bums on seats there's got to be a sort of sense in which you believe there's there's a bigger picture at play presumably and and that maybe we're do i mean do you do you feel like there's a you know around the corner there might be some great religious revival you know maybe it's jordan peterson's gonna be the one who ushers it in who knows but but you know what what's your feeling is is it just a because because i can't believe that you're just resigned to the fact that hey this might be the end of the road for my denomination or you know the church in in the west because because of decline well my denomination isn't much older than than your uh ethical movement and i think that part of that's the difference whereas you know, I have a degree of sobriety about my local congregation or even my denomination. I I am completely optimistic about the future of Christianity. And I see Christianity as having had to reform itself many different times throughout its history, and especially being a Protestant. So in the Protestant Reformation, there was just a flurry of new religious activities and, and new denominations and new ways to instantiate Christianity all over the world. And Methodism comes through and, and reshapes it. And, you know, Pentecostal, the Pentecostal revival at the beginning of 20th century just, just seeds churches all over the world. And I, I do believe that with all of the disruption and transformation that recent technological change, such as the Internet, is causing— I see a lot of the work that I'm doing on the internet, hopefully as part of sort of prototyping what next iterations of Christianity are going to look like. Now, I'm I'm 100% on the same page with you that I, even despite the internet, I don't think there is any substitution for face-to-face committed community. And I tell, people will often say to me, well, you're my pastor. I'm not your pastor. You don't meet in this room back here. I'm happy to be your friend. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm glad you listen to my videos, including my sermons. But a pastor is someone who knows your story and can smell your breath and can embrace you and can knit you together with a whole group of people that are like but different and can and and can in fact be a body in Christianity of course the body of Christ together and whereas i think we're going to continue to see a lot of disruption in the church i i do believe and i i'm seeing it in fact that at least in my online communities I see Orthodox and Catholic and Protestant and and even non-Christians, and we're all gathering together. And I I think one of the real forays in the future around what I'm doing with Estuary is 
I want the church to be a place where people can go for a meaningful conversation, not just a good show, not just a good sermon, not just some teaching, but much more interaction. And so, as I think we've been seeing in Christian denominations for a while that have been working small groups, um, I think small groups where people can actually know and be known, love and be loved, will be the future. But figuring out how to adjust institutions, mm. that's going to take some time. Yeah. Well, we, we we may be, as you say, sort of in the early point of, of the next great, you know, sort of transformation. You know, the Internet in the last 20 years has changed everything. And then COVID comes along to add another spanner in the works. And yeah, and and you're right. I mean, a hundred years from now, you know, what 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 might the next iteration of Christianity look like? I want to come back to what the next sort of iteration of godless congregations may look like, James, and what your your hopes and dreams are are for for your movement as well. But we'll we'll do that in just a moment's time because we're we're bumping up against our final break, and uh, and we'll finish off this conversation on the future of godless and uh, god believing congregations with my guests Paul Vanderclay and James Croft in just a moment. Have you ever found yourself tongue-tied when someone asks you, is there evidence for God? What about suffering? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? I'd like to introduce you to Confident Christianity, our online apologetics course, featuring video training from world-renowned thinkers such as William Lane Craig, John Lennox, Amy Orr Ewing and Gary Habermas. You'll learn how to understand, defend and share your faith with confidence. I'll also share lessons I've learned from over 15 years of hosting atheists and Christians in dialogue. You can enrol now at premier.org.uk forward slash course or click the link with this video. So we've been talking about godless congregations. James Croft, leader at the Ethical Society of St. Louis, uh, wrote this this quite controversial piece. Um, And I, I will just say, James, this is on a new website. Only Sky is the new sort of hub really for secular atheist voices um i know that a lot of the contributors who were on the um atheist channel at patheos have sort of moved over to this new one and uh we heard about that a few weeks ago from another guest on the show jonathan pierce but um this is this is where you're blogging regularly now is that right um only sky they call me a columnist justin i think they're trying to make me encourage me to write more (laughs) frequently by giving it that title rather than blog but yes i i'm writing there one of the things that appeals to me about only sky is that they're very interested in storytelling and narrative and they want to get away from the kind of polemical this is a bad thing conservative Christians did in America today kind of stuff that is okay. is the meat of much uh, atheist blogging. And yes. that's got an audience. But I've always been interested in trying to ask the questions like, what, yeah. what does it mean to live this life without yeah. religion? Uh, and I'm, so I'm trying to kind of lean into that with this new space. Well, well, I will make sure there's a link to to the article we've been talking about, and and I'm sure people will can go on and find out more there. Um, PaulVanderclay dot com, by the way, if you want more from Paul as well, and uh, uh, obviously search up the the YouTube videos as well on on YouTube. Um, but but what's I mean, you you painted a bit of a as you say bleak picture for the future of ethical culture. Uh, you obviously your your own congregation bucking that trend. Um, what do you see as a future and and i know that subsequently you know after after some interactions you are looking at at sort of whether there may be life in the old dog yet as it were um so what's what's the what what's the future for you of of your particular movement james i think paul said something very interesting when he talked about how christianity has reformed itself many times and he's confident about the future of christianity even if he's less sanguine about the you know, where his own denomination is headed. And I kind of feel that way about what we do in the ethical movement. I think that people feel like it's much more of an existential threat because they think that in a sense, the late 1800s was the first time this was really done. And so if this chapter of the story closes, then the whole book closes. And I don't, I've never really felt that maybe because I didn't grow up in an ethical society And I came to it from sort of the broader humanist movement. And I feel like there will always be people trying to creatively come together and ask the biggest questions about life. And there will always be people who try and do that without reference to God or the supernatural. And 
what form that takes and what label we attach to it is less important than continuing the conversation that we've been having for the past 140 plus years or however what you know, it's a lot longer than that if you look at the whole history of broadly humanistic gatherings and so i think that i don't know honestly if my actual denominational organization such as it is will be able to turn around my own movement I, I've been banging my head against that wall for the last 10 years, and it doesn't sound like a long time for many people, but I'm not quite 40 yet, so that's a quarter of my whole life. It feels like a long time to me. <laughs> and I, I don't really see it turning around right now. And and that is why I, I wrote what I wrote, because I wanted to be honest and say, at a certain point, you have to realize you're putting your energy into into something that can't actually receive it. And then the task becomes, what new thing can you build together? Um, but that doesn't mean the story's over. We've got a lot of talented, very passionate people. We have members all around the country who are so dedicated to their local communities. And I think they would be better served in their efforts by a new organization that was more little c catholic in its approach that didn't just serve ethical societies but reached out to sunday assemblies and oasis groups which is another network of non-religious congregations and other people who were trying to do similar things and said how can we help you what what expertise do we need to build to grow communities like yours and just shake off some of the shackles of expectation that come along with being part of a, a storied and influential movement because even though we've always been small, we have been influential in progressive political circles, particularly. And I think sometimes the desire to hold on to the past prevents you from grasping the future. And I think it's mm. time to mm. let go and, and build something new. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, and, and again, the, 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 the similarities are striking there, Paul, because this has often been exactly the problem with many long time mainline denominations where they've been shackled by certain traditions, ways of doing things, buildings very frequently, uh, diminishing congregations that stop them being able to innovate. And, you know, these young new denominations or networks that are kind of, you know, don't have any, you know, rules in place that they have to abide by can, can sort of, you know, do the creative thing and, and, and so on and take off. Um, and sometimes I, so, so, you know, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's a Christian principle, I suppose, that sometimes things have to die in order to be reborn again, isn't it? And so so is that, you know, is that something you're kind of just, as you say, just uh, realistic about that that might be the future for, for some denominations, possibly even your own? Um, but that, that doesn't mean the whole, you know, that the future is dead, that the future could be reborn. No, in very much way. so. And it's fascinating in America, for example, to to watch the Orthodox Church come online here. Um, you know, in the begin in the in the, the the Roman Catholic Church really only came to the fore in the United States, really in the in the twentieth century, came to be, you know, find a degree of stability. So part of part of the difficulty is that as creatures who live eighty or a hundred years on this in this world, our time span is pretty small. But the we're living within institutions and within movements that go back that go back a very long time. You know, if I if I continue to go until I retire, that will be a hundred years of ministry that my grandfather, my father, and myself have participated in. So I and I've seen churches that we planted when I first came to Sacramento in the nineties so were sort of using a seeker. Uh, methodology with big sound and popular music. And today, most of those churches have weekly sacraments and liturgies. And so I continue to watch these things change and reform. And, you know, I've part of the reason that I'm, I'm very excited about the future of Christianity is, again, I've seen it when I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic. I just watch I just watch Christianity transform, enter new cultural groups. They sort of find a new expression of Christianity within their cultural group, but yet there's still a thread to the other groups. So I'm, I, you know, it's 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 just part of my faith that in some ways, and especially as a Protestant, in some ways the wine skins sometimes wear out, but the wine seems to be transferred from one skin to another. Mm, yeah. 
James, uh, you may not use, you know, a bit such biblical metaphors for your own situation, but I mean, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you sound, in a sense, just as evangelistic uh, as Paul. You you want your movement to succeed. You want to see people come on board. You believe this is good for, you know, people, for your community, for the wider world, and, and so so that that is enough to essentially drive you to to want to. To, to see see it flourish right you 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 kind of you don't believe yeah you know, as you said it, it, it it's, it's not about people's eternal life at stake but it's this life that's at stake and and you do want people to to in a sense take that more seriously i suppose you you think there is a place for this kind of community um and and it uh, presumably for you it would be a, a tragic shame if it simply stopped in any form yeah. uh, in the future. And it, it is, in a sense, people's eternal life is at stake in the sense that, you know, it's it's the entirety of their whole existence. So, you know, all 100% of their existence is still at stake. Um, <laughs> that, yes, this is my whole life. I mean, this is what I've dedicated my career to. I chose this path because I felt like it was the way that I could use my skills to benefit my community. And it means an awful amount to me, and it's become constitutive of my identity in exactly that. I mean, I know a lot of clergy of a lot of different religious traditions who I've walked beside in all sorts of shared endeavors in St. Louis since I started this work. And we all have the same sense that our religious perspective is part of who we are. It's not just a job. It's genuinely a calling, and I feel exactly the same way about what I do. So, yeah, I mean, I hope it was clear if the people who read my article were angry about it, that it came from a very sad place. Like, I am very unhappy to have to report the death of my movement, and I'm not excited about it. But the, the mission is bigger than any one community, any one person. You know, it's it's something that I say to my congregation again and again, that even though we might be gathered together to make relationships with each other, there is a bigger picture we're a part of. It doesn't exist just to serve the social needs of our members. It exists to transfigure the world into one in which people's dignity is genuinely fully recognized. We are not done until that job is complete and i think we're going backwards right now so if anything the urgency is even greater than it was when this movement is founded and so i would be sad if it it stopped the work won't stop because our movement stops people will still find ways but we have resources and we have an opportunity to play a role in the great conversation that's going on about what we want our nations to look like what we want humanity to move towards it's a very unsettled time and we could be a voice mm, mm, giving mm. some sense of moral clarity at a time when it's desperately needed and so often we seem so unsure about what we have to say and i want to i want to wake people up a bit so mm. i mean who knows yeah. what will happen but <laughs> well we we, we, maybe we'll check in again in another 10 years yeah in another see. 10 years <laughs> Who knows? gosh i can't even <laughs> think about that we'll, we'll all be worshiping at the church of st jordan peterson by then you know that that'll be where oh, we'll I, I would uh, rather uh, join paul's church uh, than that one <laughs> 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 anyway um it's, it's been great chatting with you um james and paul thanks thanks for just a, a really interesting conversation one of those open-ended just you know interesting chats uh, on today's show and i've really appreciated both of you um again um links to james's article and only sky the new website that he and many others are contributing to from the sort of secular and humanist side paul uh for paul's channel and where you can see more of his videos and blogs and so on but just uh, make sure to, to uh, uh, block you out your whole evening if you want to watch one of paul's videos <laughs> that's true yeah yeah we we keep these we keep these conversations like very short compared to paul we're, we're still know, praying Paul's for you to embrace your inner joe know, rogan then, justin <laughs> oh well i don't know I, i'll take the money I, I, i'm i'm not sure about the controversy you know with joe rogan but anyway um it's it's been great to catch up with you both thank you very much and and uh yeah i hope we can do this again again at some point thanks guys thank, thank you, you.
For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.